So who's this guy, Jonathan Gassman? He, he can't be worse than Alan Gassman. And I wonder if they're related. Ladies and gentlemen, this show only gets worse. Today, we're gonna to talk about trust and probate litigation. It make your head spin. Sorry, it broke. Anyway, we're gonna get started in about one minute, which is also known as a 10th of a billable hour to many professional service people, including you. And save your charitable questions for noon when Jonathan Gassman will join us, unfortunately. Welcome to Saturday, December 18th, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 a.m. for those of you in California who don't have your watches on. I'm Alan Gassman. I had cataract surgery on Thursday, so I have these special plus seven reading glasses. Aren't they cool? And we're going to talk about something very important that quite candidly doesn't get talked enough about until it's too late, and that is avoiding estate and trust litigation and beneficiary squabbles. And as estate planners, and most of the attendees here are estate planners or people planning their estates, let me first thank Jonathan Blotmacher for allowing me to use these slides. And I've also shared with you his amazing outline on avoiding trust litigation. Now, Jonathan has a line of strategies that I'm not gonna get to today that his strategies include, get this, having the probate before the person dies, which you can do in Alaska and have it binding on all the beneficiaries. So while grandma's still alive, they get this notice that her probate's going on. And if anyone wants to complain about her will, they need to do it now while she's alive so she could change the will and disinherit them. So there's, there's other beautiful strategies in Jonathan's white paper. I helped him uh, refine it a little bit this year, and we presented at uh, Notre Dame University. You can also purchase the replay of that. If you're interested in doing that, let me know. It does include continuing education credit. And as you know, the number one question we get from professionals who attend our webinars are, does this qualify for continuing education credit? And the answer always is no, because it's not good enough. But I'm very pleased that our attendees are people who don't need the continuing education credit because they already got more than they need. What they're looking for is the knowledge. And one piece of knowledge that I was quite candidly never given as a young lawyer and a training lawyer, and when I got an LLM in taxation and estate planning was be alert to potential litigation before it happens. So we're gonna talk here about the red flags and some practical and innovative ways that you can reduce the risk and the cost of litigation. And people are shocked when I say, if you live in a metropolitan area with two to three million people or more, then right now, at this moment in time, there are probably 20 lawyers working on probate litigation matters. And there are probably 10 to 15 lawyers who do nothing in your community but trust and probate litigation. It is, it is very common. And sometimes, quite candidly, it's just caused by ambiguities and questions where no one's sure what the result should be. So everybody does the great American hobby and litigates over it, right? Sue the son of a guns. Sometimes that's fun but usually towards the end, it's not so fun. So the first thing you can do for your family or your client is go through and find the factors that would cause litigation to be a high risk situation. And if it is, then make changes in the communications and in the structure of the estate plan to reduce the litigation exposure or if you can't avoid it, at least to make it less problematic. So the first thing here is 
is the testator or testatrix. So the testator is the male person who's going to sign a will. The testatrix is the female person. Maybe they considered them to be tricky back in past generations. I'm not sure what the unisex term for this is going to be. But anyway, if they're really old, then you can expect litigators to say, well, they were, she was 85 years old. How could she have known what she was doing? Believe it or not, doctors will put a, a, the words I've seen in the patient chart, light dementia. Now, what the heck does light dementia know? And as a lawyer, do I have a duty to go look at the, the uh, medical records of my client, who seems pretty competent in the conference room, to find out that she has light dementia? And then number three, uh, beneficiaries out of contact. In other words, I haven't really seen my daughter in a long time, but I do want to benefit her. That be an issue. Then the second place where this happens a lot is remarriages. Floyd has three children. Mary has three children. Floyd and Mary decide everyone should be treated equally. Floyd dies. Mary doesn't treat everyone equally. Did the documents provide for this? It can be very complicated because so often these married couples, they want the IRA to go completely to the surviving spouse. Well, you could have the surviving spouse agree to use the IRA in certain ways that might disqualify the IRA. So sometimes there's not clear answers, but when you have spouses who have children by a previous marriage, first of all, the, the estate planning is much more complicated if you're gonna do it right most of the time. And secondly, that risk of litigation is there. And then C, and you see a lot of this is, and I call it the imbalanced child. You know, clients have four children, three are normal, great, loving, well-balanced, self-supporting children. The fourth one, not so much, and married to some sort of a person that nobody likes. And when mom breaks her hip, who's gonna move in with mom to help her? Well, that's the child without the job. That's the child with the imbalanced spouse. And that's the child that mom may start to favor after she tells her to favor her. So we have to be careful. And then particularly aggressive individuals, they just tend to be pushier and try to push their way to a uh, better conclusion on what they will inherit. And if you go to L&M, is there a history of dishonesty in the family? I believe that 96% of the people are very, very honest. 4%, not so much. I'm not sure which, which you are, none of us are perfect. But when there's a lot of dishonesty going on, the chance of litigation will be higher. And M, history of litigation in the family. If there's already been litigation between family members, you know that there are going to be issues. And let me mention that this trust and probate litigation can easily cost $150,000 to $250,000 to prosecute and $150,000 to $250,000 to defend. That's not unusual for an estate worth $400,000, but what about an estate worth $10 million? I was recently involved in a uh, case where the costs of lawyers and experts have more than exceeded $4 million. So you have to be very careful in this area on, on how you tread. So let me also remind, especially the non-lawyers here, there are certain things that you can communicate with in certain ways of communication that will have to be revealed to the other side someday. And that can include your own file. Because when my client dies and a personal representative or executor is appointed to serve, the first thing they want to do is look in my files and see things that I wrote in my files that may not be favorable to them and may even paint them in a bad way. So none of our files are absolutely privileged. And you have to be careful in that respect. 
Now the clergy client privilege, in most states there's a CPA client privilege, the spousal privilege, the psychotherapist privilege. There's no privilege for your best friend. You can send emails to your best friend, even expecting it to be confidential, and it will not be confidential. So you have to be very careful. And uh, email stands for evidence mail. Whatever you email, thank you to Dennis Kleinfeld, one of my favorite law professors and friends, whatever you email and someday whatever you text is going to be used against you. The next thing I'm gonna mention that I, that I discuss in a number of my talks, and I mean this seriously, is don't be a jerk and don't deal with jerks because jerks get sued more often, jerks sue more often, and they can have a bad effect on other people. So for example, I had one of my best referral sources refer a gentleman to our office who had a need for some uh, consultation in one of my areas, and he was rude to the person who answered the phone, and then he was rude to the intake person. So we politely told him, well, we're very busy. We don't really do exactly what you want done. Here's a couple of lawyers who are better at it than we are. So then he emailed back and said, I'll pay Mr. Gassman twice his hourly rate. I really need an hour. And then the referral source emailed me and said, could you please see him? And I said, I have to apologize, but we have a policy that if people are rude to our office staff, we don't take them as clients. And I have a selfish reason for that. I know that by the law of probability and experience that those people who are polite to me, but rude to my staff will eventually be rude to me. And they could hurt my feelings and make me cry or sue me. So be careful who you deal with. And even if it's great business opportunities and great family opportunities, if they're a jerk or they hang out with a jerk, then try to minimize your exposure. The type of person that we see over and over and over again in trust and in administrative litigation is someone who has the borderline personality. And a very good book on this is the book called Walking on Eggshells, which explains the borderline person and that those around the borderline person are always walking on eggshells because anything might cause the borderline person to make someone into an enemy. Because people with the borderline personality disorder have to hate someone. And when they, when they decide to hate that person, they create as much evidence in their minds and they do whatever they can to cause more evidence to occur to trigger responses in that person. So you know borderline people, you just haven't really recognized that they're borderline people. If you have a borderline client, you have to be very, very careful to document all of their concerns and to question whether their concerns are legitimate and real. When you are receiving the description of a borderline person who's involved with your client, Again, we become much more careful. Now, going back to the question of, is a person a jerk and going to cause litigation? Always try to follow Dale Carnegie's principles. He had a wonderful book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and then in my opinion, even a better book on how to stop worrying and start living. And when I am working with somebody who may have issues or is working with somebody else with issues, I can find advice in Dale Carnegie's book from the 1930s that, in my opinion, is unsurpassed. So I think a lot of you know who Sri Kumar Rao is because I've shown some Sri Kumar Rao videos. Sri Kumar Rao tells the story of a young tribal warrior who is reaches his age of adulthood and is brought into the adult uh, membership of an Indian tribe. 
And he says to the elder, what's the most important thing I should know? And the elder says, inside every person is a wolf and a dog. And the wolf is violent and means harm and will do harm. And the dog is helpful and loving and wants to help. When you work with a person, understand this and always feed the dog. So when I'm speaking with another lawyer who tends to be abrasive or tends to possibly make things worse than they are, instead of being abrasive back and helping to make things worse than they are, I can try to feed the dog. Hi, John, it's good to see you. It's good to see you, your client's a jerk. Oh, I'm not, I'm not sure my client's a jerk. Tell me about your client. Well, my client, your client did this to my client, your client did this to my client. Well, well, John, we're both aware that we could probably patch this thing up if we send them to a psychologist. Would you be agreeable to send them to a psychologist? Well, I don't know, I don't believe in psychologists. Well, John, you know, we have a common client, Max. And Max and his wife went to a psychologist and they patched that marriage up. Uh, and then five years later, when they were actually divorced, they were very gentle with the children. Would you mind sending our clients to that? Well, maybe I will. See, that's a different result than I, if I, I'd say, John, I completely disagree with you. We're going to have to go to court. So just, uh, I think Sri Kumar explains it better than I do, but think about feeding their dog not their wolf and trying to turn around that jerky person and dale carnegie does a great job of explaining how you go to somebody and say wow you're really good at this we could even you could even be better and induce them to please not be jerks especially when you're when it's your own client so now i have a number of slides that talk about the red flags and what to do with them and the first red flag on page 17 is the second family. The next red flag is the not so good trustee. The next red flag is the child out of kilter. The next red flag is the unfair estate plan. And the next, the next red flag is the incapacitated or unhealthy client. And then the warning signs of dementia and Alzheimer, and then ambiguities and mistakes. So let me go back through these because, oh, impossible divorces, and I have to be home by four, or I might have one. Also, the unwise spending, the person who's a spendthrift and gets themselves into financial trouble, uh, and bad investments. So I'll just have a, I'll just say a couple of words about each of these things. You can read the slides at your discretion. What happens over and over with the second family is that one spouse tends to alienate the children of the other spouse or vice versa. And when the client gets older, the more strong-willed spouse who may be sharper in mental acuity may say, well, we never got a Christmas card. We never got a Hanukkah card. They never call. Then the child says, well, I send Hanukkah cards. I send Christmas cards. When I call, the competent spouse married to my father or my mother says that he's not available. Okay, well, he's get, the client's getting the message that the kids don't care about him and they're being abrasive. The children are getting the merit, the, the, uh, the message, don't come near your, your, your parent. You're not welcome here. So what do we do? One thing we talk about early in the estate planning process, when this couple first gets married, they're in their 60s, then they're in their 70s, then they're in their 80s, and it may be too late. But when they're in their 60s, and the older spouse, I'll call him the father, because that's usually what it is, set up an irrevocable trust for the benefit of his descendants. He, he loves them, they get along, he sets up an irrevocable trust. He has his CPA be the trustee. He puts 25% of his net worth in the trust. It's a spousal limited access trust, but there's no intended benefits to be paid to his spouse. 
So now when he gets dementia, that 25% is locked in for the children. The spouse doesn't have a voice in it. The CPA has the voice. So the spouse knowing that it's going to the children when the spouse dies, there's nothing to fight about there. At least we preserve that part of it. Now, this may be life insurance. You may have clients who did not need life insurance before they remarried. And then they say, well, when I die, I want 50% to go to my children, 50% to go to my spouse. But I put all my assets into joint names with my spouse because I need the creditor protection because I live in a tendency by the entirety state like Florida, Delaware, or Wyoming. Okay, well, how are we going to give your kids half when your spouse is giving it all? And by the way, if we give your children the IRAs, they're going to pay income tax on it within 10 or 11 years of your death. If we leave it to your spouse, your spouse can roll it over. So that's where life insurance may come in. And maybe a, a, a put enough money in the life insurance trust to pay all the plan premiums. So the children are uh, going to get something. So what many clients do uh, once we've talked about it, is we set up what we call a marital asset preservation system, MAPS, which basically says that when one of us dies, the survivor will fund a trust with a minimum percentage of the total net worth of the clients. The trust can be in an asset protection jurisdiction where it's protected from the creditors of the new spouse. It will be solely for the new spouse and the descendants of the first dying spouse, but the new spouse doesn't touch it unless the new spouse runs out of everything else. And this will protect the surviving spouse both from malpractice claims against him. When he remarries, then his new spouse cannot reach into this trust. It is not for the new spouse, next spouse, it's for only the surviving spouse and the children of the first dying spouse. So when you ask clients, do you realize that the estate planning documents that I did for you provide no protection for a subsequent marriage? Everything's joint with right of survivorship. Is that okay with you? The clients can act very surprised. So it's just a discussion that needs to take place. Now, page 22, the not so good trustee, it happens almost every month in our office. We get a situation where, well, Uncle Charlie's such a nice guy and dad died and left the, tr the trust to be administered by Uncle Charlie, but he's been too busy to do anything and he borrowed some money out of it and he forgot to get insurance and he actually gave, accidentally gave one child more than she's entitled to, and he hasn't gotten us the tax records yet, and he never returns the phone calls of the investment advisor, but he's such a great guy. He's such a great guy, and we're stuck with him. So my suggestion, I, I make two suggestions. The first suggestion is Uncle Charlie will be co-trustee with his choice of the client's CPA, maybe a well-recognized trust lawyer, or a trust company, it could be Uncle Charlie's choice, but he's got to have a CPA, or a trust company, or a trust lawyer, or someone else who can put checks and balances there. If the client insists on Charlie being the sole trustee, then I'd like to have a provision saying that any child could add a trust company co-trustee at that child's expense. Charlie can choose the trustee, but there needs to be one. A lot of clients say, I don't want a bank trust company to be the trustee of my trust because I've heard such terrible things about bank trust companies. Well, they can be expensive, but most of the bad things you hear about bank trust companies are because the beneficiaries don't like them because they won't let the beneficiaries do what the beneficiaries want to do. And that's usually a good thing, believe it or not. If the trusteeship is Uncle Charlie with his choice of a trust company, and he has the power to replace the trust company with an alternate trust company, but there always has to be a trust company, then you can get the best of both worlds. First of all, he can shop and get a low expense trust company. He can probably negotiate a discount from their fees if he, before he chooses them, 
And then he can, since he can replace them if they don't do a good job, they are probably going to do a better job. In addition, if you see here on page 22, for most of our trust work, we suggest that the client determine if they wanna have trust protectors. And they say, what is a trust protector? Well, a trust protector is somebody who can change the trusteeship or amend the trust. Who can be a trust protector? Well, no beneficiary can be a trust protector. The ideal trust protector, quite honestly, is somebody who, while you're alive, will do whatever you ask, unless it's bad for you, in which case they'll ask why you want it done. You can have a trust protector who can only act with the consent of your spouse if your spouse is surviving, but the trust protectors can replace Uncle Charlie. So the trust protectors are like the board of directors of the company, and Uncle Charlie is like the president. And that's uh, the issue there. Now, the child out of kilter, this is a very, very tough one. First of all, as you know from my prior discussions and Robert Heinlein's quote, don't handicap your children by making their lives too easy. Clients, I believe, are much smarter to leave trust or at least in young adulthood. And many of us are young in maturity until we're 75, by the way. To have the child be responsible for checks and balances. For example, our typical planning document says that Uncle Charlie and the trust company he chooses will be the trustee. The child can be a co-trustee at 25, but they'll be outvoted. At 35 or 40, they can be co-trustee with their choice of any trust company. And they can't take out more than 150,000 a year if, unless something's happened that causes them not to be able to work until retirement age. That's an oversimplified example. But for the child that's really out of kilter, the one who's going to sue for more than their share, you can make distributions to them and even their presence in the trust document completely discretionary. So I've got the three trustworthy children and the one child who's not trustworthy. They're the trust for the three who are trustworthy with a clause that says that the trust protectors can add other descendants into the trust for up to 25% without even naming the child. So the child starts off in a very insecure position. She's not even named in the document. She's got to behave very nicely for these trust protectors to add her. And in order to be added, she may have to sign releases and hold harmlesses of all of the family members. So that would give the trustees a lot of leverage to work with her. Another idea that we commonly do pursue is we ask the children to sign an inheritance agreement. And the inheritance agreement says, we all agree we're gonna get 25%. And if mom wants to give one of us more, then that one of us who gets more is gonna share with the other three. Also, if one of us loans money to mom or provides services to mom that she needs and for whatever reason didn't pay for, that money comes off the top. Because what do you have? You have the situation where mom's gonna come home from a, from a surgery and you want a nurse there at the house and mom's not gonna pay for it. We've all had that. Well, mom, I'll pay for it. I'm the wealthiest child. I'll be glad to pay for it. And by the side agreement, it's coming back to me from all of our shares after mom passes. So now the children are encouraged to spend money on mom when she's not willing to spend it on her own. So some of the takeaway here, takeaways here are get a written agreement from the children while the, while the client is living that they will not contest the actual trust agreement attached to the agreement, and that if it changes to their benefit, they will adjust with their siblings unless their siblings agree to the contrary, or it is adjusted by trust protectors. 
that can really, to be honest, that can calm things down. You know, it doesn't have to be spy versus spy. Like I need to steal from mom before my sister steals from mom because we're both thieves. It's better for them to sign an agreement to have transparency and to get copies of mom's statements every month. If that would be more comfortable for everyone. So again, we have to think these things through. They don't always just appear. You have to talk to the client and decide what works best. Now, the other thing we see a lot is the temptation to substitute judgment. What does that mean? The temptation to substitute judgment. Mrs. Jones, you have a really stupid estate plan. Here's one I often see. I leave my house to my daughter and my ranch to my son and the rest of the assets to my grandchildren. Now, what happens when you sell the house? Well, sorry, your son's out of luck because they sell, you have to because you sold the house. You need to sell the house to get into a nursing home. The agent under your power of attorney is afraid to sell the house because they'll be sued by your son. So please don't have an estate plan that just leaves certain things to certain people unless there are intricate adjustment clauses which make up for what happens in the future. A lot of people think you have to leave $5,000 to somebody in order to write them out of the will. That's not correct. You don't have to mention them at all. You don't have to leave them $10. You can simply say that I have thought it over carefully and have decided to only benefit my children, John, Mary, and Monica and their descendants, and not to benefit any other person. Because you don't want to necessarily embarrass the child who is not going to inherit. And then you could even add, because my other potential beneficiaries are very talented, uh, well self-supporting, and highly commendable. So again, you know, don't start down the feed the wolf path. We're going to start down the uh, dog path. Commonly happens that I'd like to mention is that clients will come to me and say, okay, we're setting up the irrevocable slat. We're going to put 30% of our net worth in the irrevocable slat. That's a spousal limited access trust for one, for the, one of the spouses. And then after that, we want it to all go to our cute, beautiful grandchildren. Not our children, just our cute, wonderful grandchildren. Well, that's for puberty of the grandchildren. The grandchildren go through puberty and they don't even call grandma or grandpa. And in fact, they're not all that admirable maybe. So grandma and grandpa come back and say, we wanna leave it to the children. Well, I'm sorry you can't, because I allowed that irrevocable trust to have no adjustment clause. So when a client wants to favor a child or a grandchild in an irrevocable trust, please remember that that is more likely to be changed and to cause heartache later. So what I prefer to do is, you know, John and Floyd, I understand you love the grandchildren. They look so adorable. So, Let's use this irrevocable trust to benefit your children, and let's have the grandchildren benefit under your revocable trust so that when you go to take these little SOBs out of your estate plan later, we don't have to call on trust protectors to do controversial things under your irrevocable trust. Now, that is subject to generation skipping tax planning, which is something that we can you know, handle in the irrevocable trust by providing that it never goes to the children. It is held for their health, education, maintenance, and support. So that's a little bit about the unfair estate plan. And please do think ahead. Think ahead, leaving certain things to certain people causes distortion and, and also locking people into something that's more likely to change than what they have in their revocable trust estate plan can, can also be unwise. Okay, so now we go to the 
incapacitated or unhealthy client. And one thing I'll tell you is that certain diagnoses that a client has cause it to be unlikely that they will finish their estate plan with me or anyone else. And, and one thing that I find to be upsetting is when I've met with a client, I know they have a short life expectancy. I send those documents out as soon as I can. And then they don't get around to it. They don't get around to it. Then they get really sick and then they die. And my beautiful documents don't get used. So one thing I do try to do with, with that particular client is I want them to sign a temporary estate plan. I had a situation last year. I'm kind of proud of it. Uh, he was a longtime client. He came in at 10 in the morning. He was a procrastinator. He said, I've got, I just did a biopsy. There's a good chance I have pancreatic cancer. I need to update the estate plan. Well, fortunately, I had nothing on my calendar from 10 till 2. Said, what do you want to do? He wants to do this, this, the other thing. Finally, making decisions he should have made over the last 15 years. I said, you know what? Go have lunch and come back. So uh, I worked with the secretary. We got all the documents to where at least they could be a survivable solution compared to what he had. He came back in, he reviewed the documents. I made a few more changes. Uh, we made it very clear that this was temporary, but the best we could do, I didn't let him leave. He wanted to leave, nope, I made him stay. He signed the documents at two o'clock. I went into my next meeting. He died four weeks later. Now, you know, when the life expectancy is, is, is short, and especially before they start the chemo, chemo doesn't make you feel good usually, and it doesn't do well for your, for your mental processes. So you really, even if they have to come in on a Saturday, even if it's a temporary estate plan, and quite often the discussion of death is avoided. When I'm one with this client, I am going to say, you know, we don't know how long you have. You may, you may tell me you have two years. The doctors may have told you you have two years. You may die in a month. We need to get this done. Talk to the spouse. The spouse says, well, I don't really want to talk to my spouse about they may die soon. Okay, but they may die soon. So we, we can't act like they might not. We need to get this thing done. So I have not had clients say, well, I'm all upset because you said I might die. Now, I think it's a better approach to hit it right on and be honest, they need someone they can talk to. You know, they can get to their psychotherapist, they can get to their grief counselor and all that stuff, but you're in the, you're there also, and you are a voice of reason. So yeah, I was sorry to hear that my client, my longtime client at 10 a.m. told me that he probably had pancreatic cancer, but I had to tell him, I said, you know, my track record of people with pancreatic cancer is not so good. More than half of them never signed the estate plan. Would you mind staying here until we get the darn thing done? And I was just really glad he did. So I don't know if I beat that horse too many. Oops, shouldn't say that. Those humane society people now I'll get a whole bunch of calls. I love horses. I do love horses. Um, but that's important. Now, the warning signs of dementia. Now with a lawyer who does most of his estate plans based upon no more than 30 minutes with the clients. Now, if you spend only 30 minutes with the clients, you're not going to pick up on a medium case of dementia because one spouse will answer all the questions and the other spouse will just keep nodding and telling jokes and you won't realize that the second spouse really doesn't know what's going on. So you may pick up on, wow, 12 minutes ago, I mentioned the partnership, and now she's asking me about the partnership, but she seems very competent. That probably means that I need to get everything I'm doing into 12 minutes, because every 11 minutes, she forgets what happened. So 
if you want to do the best you can for your clients, you may need to go ahead and stay in that room with them long enough to determine if they're competent. Rules of ethics are very unusual in this area, if I might say. I have a duty to fulfill my client's wishes. And if my client says, well, I realize I'm forgetful, but I want, this is what I want to do. I know I'm forgetful, but this is what I want to do. And I'm not delusional, I'm just forgetful. So my job now is to support the proposition that the client is competent to the extent I can because that's my client. But that doesn't mean I can't try to convince my client, hey, are you sure you should be doing this? Should we have your children involved in case they vehemently disagree with what you're doing? Should I talk to your doctor and see what medications you're on? Maybe you're not on the right medications. Have you ever seen a neurologist or a gerontologist or a psychiatrist who might be able to identify or help the situation? So they come back with a doctor's note. The doctor says, John seems competent. He spent 12 minutes with John, maybe 14, and John seems competent. Whereas if you go to a memory uh, center, they'll do four to six hours of testing. So they'll know four hours later whether he remembers what was talked about at the beginning. And they'll tell you how good the short-term memory is and whether the cognitive arithmetic is working, whether the cognitive verbal is worth it working. And once you have that full report, now you're in a better position to plan the estate. There's a lot of question as to whether you should videotape the whole meeting. The good news is you, if you do videotape the whole meeting, you have an exact replica of the meeting and it makes your deposition a lot easier because they say well did he talk about the date i don't remember did he talk about the president i don't remember did he talk about his cousin i don't remember it was four years ago versus well he, watch the videotape watch the videotape watch the videotape a situation about four months ago where there was significant undue influence going on really by a caretaker, uh, children who were being excluded, and a client who was very competent. And I did insist on videotaping that. I got his consent before the, before the uh, videotaping event. And I videotaped everything from the moment he walked in the door. I walked in afterwards, got the consent to my secretary got the consent to run that video from before I walked in, right through the time when he walked out the door. So I have an entire report of everything he wanted to do, which was including leaving some assets to the person who was exerting the undue influence after a long discussion of the undue influence. And I advised him against this, but at least now I've done my best and I've videotaped it all. Now, many lawyers say that's a bad idea, because if he was forgetful during the interview, it's gonna hurt you. Well, I guess if he had been forgetful during the interview, I could have stopped, I could have erased the video, but then later when questioned, I would have to explain why I erased it. Maybe I should have sent him to a probate litigation lawyer instead of handling it myself, but that would have been a red flag also. So if your client is highly competent, I think the videotape is very good, it's very convincing. I did a videotape once that ran two and a half hours. Law students asked this client for two and a half hours about his legal career, about his estate plan, about his life, about his regrets, about what he was proud of. And, and that videotape not only documented a very competent man, but also the grandchildren were astounded to learn all those things about him after he died. They had no idea that he had done this and that because he never told them or they were never listening. So consider that, consider, well, you know, you're, you're a really interesting guy. Would you mind if I had my law students interview you just for your children and posterior? And then I can watch the, the, uh, the interview and decide how we're going with the estate plan. Then after the interview, if he's making a lot of mistakes, give the videotape to the family and say, this is, it. This is so you have history on your grandfather and do the estate plan 
separate and apart, maybe. At least think about it, bring it up, uh, decide how to best handle the situation with, with uh, dementia. Now, believe it or not, lawyers make mistakes. Clients make mistakes telling us things, and then we put the mistake in the document, or we make the mistake. The computer leaves a line out meant to say to my spouse, my children, and my grandchildren. But for some reason, the words and my grandchildren didn't appear in the document. It's in the letter I wrote the client that explained what he wanted. It's in the letter he came to that he wrote to me, but it didn't make it in the document. I don't remember if he told me to take it out or not. I don't think he did, or I would have probably had a note. Maybe the secretary made an error. Uh-oh. Do I A call my malpractice insurance carrier, or B, call the trust protectors, or C, is my law firm appointed to be the scrivener protector with the right to correct that document? And this will avoid litigation because the grandchildren are going to show up and want to sue me, and they're in the document, so it's not a problem. Or a child may just make a stink over a little ambiguity in the middle of a paragraph saying, I'm gonna make your life miserable, Mr. Lawyer, unless you do some things for me, reduce your fees. No, that's fine, we, we fixed it. The Scrivener fixed it. It's hard to reform a trust or a will in court for a mistake if you don't have 100% cooperation from all the beneficiaries. So again, that's where that trust protector and what we call the Scrivener protector language can, can come in. Okay, the possible divorce scenario. Divorce happens at every age and is usually a surprise to at least one of the spouses, if not their lawyer. I live in Florida, most of my clients are in Florida. In Florida, everything gets shared. If it was accumulated during the marriage, it gets shared equally. It doesn't matter whose name it's in. And that's the case in most states. And when I form a SLAT, when I put 30% of my net worth into a spousal limited access trust for Marsha and our descendants, it has a provision in it that it says that if we get divorced, half of it stays in the SLAT for Marsha, and I have no further voice in that SLAT. And half of it is held for our descendants, and I can choose the trustee and replace the trustee. And the Nevada trustee could add me as a beneficiary if my net worth ever goes down terribly. So now I've got the possible benefit of half of what I gave away, and it's protected from uh, the next spouse. Just think those things through and don't be upset when the lawyer has you sign a conflict of interest letter which says i'm representing both of you and if there's a if there is ever a situation where you're not getting along or you're adverse to one another then i have to step down and you each have to get a separate lawyer and anything you say to me will become discoverable by your presently beloved spouse. So think about the divorce situation and there's no problem going, calling in a family lawyer to look at a situation to see how the estate plan may, may impact it. Okay, page 29, unwise spending, expensive gifts being given. This smacks of undue influence and also is the client who's not gonna leave enough assets to even administer their estate. Try to get them psychological help. The unwise spending is something that I have had the conversation. It looks like you're spending $10,000 a month at Saks and Neiman Marcus and Nordstrom's. Is there anything I can do to help that? Because why do people spend $10,000 a month? Because they get recognition. They walk in that store, they're treated well, they have their friends in that store, and they, they have decided that the only way to get happiness is to get dopamine hits 
from interactions and acquisitions of wealth. There's probably many better ways to get dopamine hits, but the conversation needs to be had because it does cause problems up the road. And that would be a reason for on the death of the first dying spouse to lock everything up in an irrevocable trust. So if you've been watching this series, you know that we have something called the, the uh, Jess Trust, Joint Exempt Step Up Trust. So Marsha and I, instead of each owning half of our assets, we put it into one Jess Trust. And then when one of us dies, that becomes irrevocable in its entirety. And the surviving spouse is co-trustee with a trust company and less likely to do the binge spending. And there can be guidelines in that document. Well, it's fine if the neurosurgeon spouse wants to go spend 10,000 a month at Saks and Neiman Marcus and, and those stores. But when the neurosurgeon dies and is no longer earning a million dollars a year, that's got to stop. So the guideline will be 300,000 a year. So you would need a court order to spend more than 300,000 a year. So, you know, you can go to Saks and have lunch, but not bring back as many things as you were uh, bringing back. And, and some people have the Amazon, an Amazon habit. I, I, you know, I kid you not, clients who spend twenty to thirty thousand dollars a month buying stuff on Amazon that they don't have. And don't forget the Joseph Heller quote. He was at a party, a billionaire's party in New York City. The billionaire had everything imaginable. Joseph Heller says, "I have one thing that this man doesn't have," and his friend says, "What is it?" And Joseph Heller says, "I have enough." I have enough. So you can mention that to a client because maybe in therapy or elsewhere, they can get that fixed. Okay, I strongly prefer arbitration to litigation in most situations. Arbitration can be much more expensive than litigation because you have to pay not only for your lawyer, but also for the arbitrator or arbitrators. But in litigation, you get the judge. And the judge could be a good judge, a mediocre judge, or a not so good judge. And especially for my clients, I need a judge who understands finances. And a lot of judges are were criminal lawyers, or litigation lawyers who don't know anything about even what an amortization schedule is. So if I name one arbitrator through the American Arbitration Association or another arbitration association, JAMA, J-A-M-A is a very good one because they're all retired judges, I can eliminate the, bad, the, worst, the worst possibilities because unlike being assigned to one arbitrator, with the arbitration associations, they'll send you six names and say each side can blackball three. And the one remaining will be your arbitrator. So at least I can get rid of the worst or I can reach out to the other lawyer on the other side and we can agree on one who we think will be good, reasonable. That's the first advantage of arbitration. Second advantage of arbitration is a cultural tendency. Judges tend to let litigators get away with a bunch of stuff because judges get reelected and litigators donate to their, to their funds or judges are in the community, they know the litigators. It's in the public, the judge doesn't want to embarrass the litigator. Arbitrators tend to tell litigators what to do. Yes, you can do that, no, you can't do that. So that's another reason. A third reason, it avoids a jury trial. Juries can get all mixed up. They can get resentful of wealthy people, even when the wealthy person did nothing wrong. So you at least in most situations want to waive the jury trial and have a trial by judge only if you want to cut down on the expense and the unpredictability. Now, a lot of litigators also say, well, you can't appeal a bad arbitrator opinion. And that's not correct with the American Arbitration Association, and I believe with JAMA, there's an actual appellate uh, process. So if you disagree with what the, what the uh, arbitrator decides, 
then you appeal it and you can provide in your documents that anyone who appeals it will be responsible for paying for the entire appeal. So many states have laws that prevent certain things from being arbitrated, but to the extent that you can require arbitration, it's usually a good idea. But here's the main reason. The litigator calls me and says, why'd you put an arbitration clause in there? I said, I thought it was good. The litigator says, well, I hate arbitration, so we're gonna settle. So it's much more likely to settle when you have an arbitration clause. At least that's my experience or my correct or incorrect uh, prejudice. But again, if I have trust protectors that can switch things around, I may not need a uh, arbitration. Now, in many states, you can put an interim clause into a document which says anyone who contests this will or this trust is, is disinherited. Well, if you're gonna do that in your document, make sure it says this trust, as it is being signed, this date prepared by the law firm of so-and-so. Because if the client a year later goes to the flea market and finds a quote unquote legal advisor at the flea market, who changes it and disinherits a child, do you think that child should really be subject to the interim clause? Florida does not recognize or enforce interim clauses. So with Florida, I just like to give the trustees or the trust protectors the power to reallocate. So if you're gonna contest this, you may be reallocated out or go ahead and do your trust in Alaska and then have your will pour everything over into your Alaska trust or you can use Jonathan Blotmacher's uh, statute that he wrote, uh, which specifically allows an interim clause. Okay, let me see, let me answer some questions here for you. And then we're gonna be moving to uh, my hero, Jonathan Gassman. I like him even though he has a strange last name. Okay, can you provide me with contact information for a trust lawyer in California? Yes, I will. Is Walking on Eggshells the one by Jane I say, or is it Stop Walking on Eggshells by Mason and Krieger? You know, I'm not sure. I'm gonna, what I'll do is I will uh, look and let you know, but I think it's just Walking on Eggshells. Um, what potential risk and rights do clients siblings contribute to an estate issue when they feel they should have been included? Well, those greedy siblings, usually they shouldn't be included. It's good to have strong notes to show what the client wanted. And then Julie goes on with some other really good questions. Julie, if you, uh, and Julie is a elder care specialist. She does assessments for clients. She has nursing background. She takes our clients to the doctor visits, takes the clients to the specialist visits, counts the pills, make sure the client took the pills, make sure the client got the test, make sure the children know what's going on with the client. A lot of clients need a Julie. So in fact, we should probably do, have Julie come and speak at a webinar uh, soon about what she does so you could think about what you would do for your parents. Ask not what you do for your parents, but what your parents can do for you. Can, you, can I provide a good state lawyer in New Jersey? Yes, Marty Shinkman, S-H-E-N-K-M-A-N. Approximate trust company fees. There are trust companies who charge a flat fee and want nothing to do with the investments. And they can be what we call the distribution trustee and also make sure that nothing gets stolen. So the trust company fees, they can range from 1% of the amount in, uh, in the trust maybe a minimum of $5,000 a year for some trust companies, $15,000 a year for others. It, it's like buying a car. It, it can vary uh, significantly, although I don't have any trust companies in Japan or South Korea that I'm using. Not that I wouldn't. I missed your beginning. Did you have cataract surgery? Did it all come out fine? Yes, it did. Thank you very much, Dr. Colbertson at Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in Miami at the University of Miami for successfully 
giving me uh, cataract surgery and implants. I had had 18 cuts of an RK in the 1990s in one eye, 16 cuts in the other. So he was able to handle that, went through without break, without stitches, didn't have to open up the cornea with a cut. So thanks very much. Uh, I appreciate that. Okay, so I have a couple, I have more pages here that you can read at your leisure. And I'll be glad to come back and discuss any more of this um, in the future. Hopefully, if you're a lawyer, you've come out with some communications ideas. If you're a layman, then you're hopefully still awake. And now it is time to get to Jonathan Gassman, the amazing Jonathan Gassman. I met Jonathan at a uh, strategic coach meeting. We were both in strategic coach for many years. Strategic coach is an entrepreneurial uh, company that provides wonderful, wonderful workshops every 90 days for entrepreneurs and professionals. I don't have any financial relationship with Strategic Coach, but it's a, I, I have found that clients who have gone to Strategic Coach have had a great experience. Um, I have not been going there. I've been going to somewhere else. But Jonathan, are you here? Well, here we are. It's uh, December 18th, about two weeks left in the year, and people are just waking up now to doing some planning. And there's a lot of great tax planning that still can be done before the end of the year. And one of the big areas that I, I think most people miss out on is the notion of charitable planning. And charitable planning is one of those areas that it doesn't get enough um, press, as I'll call it. So, you know, first question is, who am I? Well, I'm John Gassman. We have a third generation firm. Started with my grandfather and my father up here in the Big Apple. We have global clients. Uh, my background is I'm a CPA. Uh, I'm also a certified financial plan. I'm a former chartered advisor in philanthropy. And philanthropy was always one of those things that was near and dear to my heart because my parents were always participating in events. They were always donating. They were always inviting people. It was important to give. So I grew up in an environment that fostered giving and philanthropy and, and that type of stuff. And by the way, if anybody has questions for me after, after this presentation, feel free. You have my email address, you have my phone number, you could connect with me on social media. And obviously you could send smoke signals from wherever you are because I can see smoke signals. So <laughs> <laughs> Let me. So here I am. I'm down in Florida a couple of weeks ago. I'm visiting my 95 year old mother. And um, my mother says to me, I have to do some year end planning, Jonathan. Come on. I, I, I don't like paying taxes. You're my advisor. Can't you do a better job for me? And I said, Mom, you got to be like kidding me. And she says, I'm curious, where do my tax dollars go? And I said, where do your tax dollars go? You know, they go to Izzy, Robert and Sam. They go to the government. So she says, I want to look it up. So she pulls up her laptop and I know you can't believe a 94 year old can actually, you know, use LinkedIn, use Facebook. She she is really technologically savvy. So she pulls it up. She Googles, you know, where do tax dollars go? And poof, she comes up with the 1040 instruction booklet. And at the very end, there is a pie chart that shows where her tax dollars goes. And she's looking she's like, I don't want my money to go here. This is unfair. I've paid enough taxes for 94 years. I want my money to go someplace else. So I said, Mom, you could be a voluntary philanthropist. You could, you could send your money wherever you want. You can give your money to your children. You can give your money to social programs. You can kind of designate, if you plan properly, you can control your money. And she says, well, you're not doing a very good job, JG. That's what I'm called when I'm good. When I'm bad, she says, Jonathan, and then she says, Jonathan, you're not doing a very good job. So I think I'm going to use somebody else. And I said, go ahead, mom. You don't pay me enough. So today I want to quickly share with you in the 30 minutes that I have, I want to share with you kind of the role of the advisor in philanthropic conversations, why it's important, talk about some updates in the tax law, and give you some quick, simple, single, doable things you could do between now and December 31st. And if you don't catch it by December 31st, assuming the tax laws don't change, guess what? You could still do them next year, okay? So that's kind of the way I look at this. Now, there's a very, very interesting US study report. It came about 2018. US Trust did a study on high net worth donors 
and their interactions with their advisors regarding philanthropy. And in an interview with Claire Costello, she was the head of philanthropic services, she comes up with a couple of really great points that I think are very important to guys like Alan, myself, and other advisors that are helping clients plan. And the quote I recall was, discussing philanthropy is good for the client. It's good for the advisor. And it's good for society because ultimately the advisor is potentially moving resources into public good that otherwise might not have happened without the advisor client philanthropic discussion. You know, Tim, Tim Cook, who ran uh, Apple, once said, we want to be the pebble in the pond that creates the ripple for change. And that's what I look at that we do. So we're trying to help clients figure out what they can and cannot do and how do they bridge the gap of where they are today versus where they want to be in the future. So the study came out and basically said a couple of things. One, professional advisors, guys like me, accountants, attorneys, wealth, manager, ma wealth managers are increasingly recognizing the importance of the philanthropic conversation and they're understanding how important it is to the client. Over two thirds of high net worth consumers share the view that having a philanthropic conversation is important. And furthermore, it goes through in the study, advisors think they initiate the conversation, but it's actually, if, if you really study and look at the report, it's the clients that more often than not bring up the conversation about philanthropy and charitable contributions. We look at things sometimes from a very technical perspective, tax savings, investment structuring, but what they wanna talk about more than anything else is their values, their passions, existing philanthropy, the desire to, to get the family involved with their wealth. The vast majority of clients want their advisors to have these conversations up front. You meet with a new client, they wanna start talking about this stuff. And again, I'm talking about clients, high net worth, and even uber, uber high net worth clients. Advisors are typically increasingly having these conversations. It bridges the gap from generation to generation. And there's a direct correlation between the use of charitable vehicles like a donor advice fund, a, um, a private foundation, um, charitable gift annuities with building your clientele and your business. Again, huge cor correlative influence on those that get advice versus those that don't get advice. The number one thing high net worth consumers want to know if they're eager in learning about philanthropy, interest in kind of the different types of vehicles. Number two, they want to become more familiar with different nonprofits that focus on what they want. And number three, they want to integrate their values, their charitable goals into their wealth management plan. And again, big disconnect between what advisors say and what clients say. And it's not always about the taxes. Not everything is tax generated. So how do we start the conversation with charity with a client? So I may, I may start a conversation and say something, let's say I'm meeting Alan for the first time, and this is just one entry point before we get into some of the strategies. I may simply say to Alan, hey, it's great meeting you, Alan. Um, let's talk about kind of the goals you're looking to achieve. And in order for me to figure out how Alan thinks, I may ask a question like, Alan, let me ask you a hypothetical question. Let's assume for the moment we're sitting here. Let's assume for the moment you and I are sitting here and you just found out that your aunt, that your aunt left you $5 million as a bequest. Wow, that's pretty cool, right? Absolutely. But there's a condition for you to have the $5 million, you have to give away 30% of it to a charity. Which charity would you consider giving it to? Now, Alan's either gonna say very quickly, oh, I'm gonna give it to my alma mater, or I'm gonna give it to this organization, or that organization. Or Alan's gonna say, I really don't know, JG. I, haven't, I never really thought about it. You know, it's like winning the lottery. It's like, I have to kick myself. I haven't really thought about it. So that lends itself to the philanthropic or the charitable contribution or charitable discussion. And these are kind of the couple of questions that I ask the clients when we're going down this path. Before I get to, let's talk about some strategies. I'll ask things about 
you know, what are you deeply passionate about? You know, what motivates you? Family, faith, social causes. And again, I take copious notes, you know. Two, where can you do the most good? Where, what causes don't get enough support that you want to have an impact on? Number three, which organizations address the issues you want to support? You know, let's do some due diligence. Let's ascertain how you can get involved. You know, how do you want to donate? Do you want to just give money? Do we want to give time? Do you want to be on a board? Do you want to be on a committee? What does success look like to you? And again, to the point of uh, that Alan mentioned about strategic coach, I'll usually say something like, and this is a, a question that Dan Sullivan would usually, the Dan Sullivan is the founder, he would say something, if we're sitting here an hour from now, what has to happen for you to feel like you got value from this conversation? I may say to the client, listen, Mr. Client, what does a win look like at the end in terms of your philanthropy? And that will lend itself to ultimately the conversation of how do we incorporate philanthropy and charitable giving in a meaningful, significant way? And remember, most people, it's not just about the taxes. Most of them are looking to give because it's important to them. It makes them feel good. They're making a difference in the world. Does that make sense? I'm sure it does as everybody's shaking their head in the affirmative. So let's talk about where we are in terms of taxes. Well, the Trump tax bill changed a lot of things. It reduced the rates from 39 to 37%, and it also changed the way we take certain deductions. There's a cap on state and local taxes, as you know, to 10,000, right? People used to deduct their real estate taxes. There's state and local taxes, especially those in the Northeast. It was kind of significant. Now you have a choice of either door number one or door number two, as Monty Hall would say. Let's make a deal. You're either gonna claim a standard deduction which is a specific dollar amount, or you're gonna claim itemized deductions, whichever is higher. So what you're seeing now are more and more of our clients, and I think the statistics are about 85% of those that file tax returns are now actually not itemizing, but they're taking a standard deduction instead because the only thing they can deduct is their state and local taxes to 10,000, their mortgage interest, and think about a retiree. Do they have a mortgage? Typically not as much anymore. And their charitable contributions. So if they're married filing a joint return, are they getting over the $25,000 hurdle? Maybe not. And for those that, and, and this is important too, for those that don't itemize deductions, they're allowed to take an above the line deduction for either $300 if they're young and single, or if $600 if they're married filing a joint return. The CARES Act also made a very, very significant change because there are caps on how much you're allowed to deduct in a given year. It raised the amount to 100% for cash donations to a public organization. So in other words, if let's say um, I make $100,000 and I wanna give away 80,000, I can deduct the entire 80,000 as long as it's a cash contribution to a public charity. I could go up to 100,000. If I go over my AGI, whatever is above and in excess will be a carryover into the next year. So that's a little history on where we are in terms of deductibility. Standard deduction or itemized, there are certain limitations and certain caps. So let's run through an example. And this literally just happened the other day. I got a call, it was on December 15th. My client, no, it wasn't Fred or Wilma, the, the um, from the Flintstones, but it was a client that I kind of call him a Fred, a very nice guy. And he says, hey, JG, I just got my $100,000 bonus before the end of the year. What tax savings ideas do you have for me? And this guy is, he's a pretty philanthropic guy. They, they, they donate every year to various organizations. And he says to me, I'm thinking, you know, I have this pledge for $2,000 a year to this organization. Do you think I should pay it off? And usually, he's been actually taking the standard deduction. So he would not get a benefit for making you know, a $2,000 deduction. However, if he decides, hey, let me bump it up and give the other 8,000 so we'll get a total for the year of 10,000, he'll actually be able to itemize this year, thereby reducing his taxable income. So by bunching you know, several years of contributions into one year, he's able to capture a deduction. Now, 
what happens if you don't know who you want to give it to? Let's say you're 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 sold on the idea of okay, I'm into this. I could give away some significant money, but I just don't know who I want to give the money to. You know, what's the answer? So the answer is we could set up what we call a charitable giving account. And I want to spend about five minutes talking about this because between now and the end of the year, these are probably the most popular tool or vehicle that's out there for those that want to lock in a deduction. So basically what a donor advised fund or a charitable giving account, I call it, is basically a, 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 a charitable account that's established by a public charity. That's all it is. It's just an account that's set up by, by a public charity. And it could be called, you could name it, you set it up as the Alan Gassman Charitable Fund, the John and Stephanie Gassman Charitable Fund. You could call it whatever you want. And the benefit is it's easy to set up. You get an immediate contribution. You could recommend grants out of this account for a period of time. And you've captured an upfront tax deduction immediately this year, even though it didn't actually go to the charities that you ultimately wanted to, but because it's going to a, a public charity that you have set it up with, you immediately capture the tax deduction. So what's involved with this? Well, a donor can establish the donor advice fund immediately. It, there's very little cost. There are several charitable sponsors um, and, and all it requires is a stroke of a pen on filling out an application. Minimum contributions, and I'm not here to sell you on one organization versus another. We trade with Fidelity. I'm, I'm familiar with Fidelity's. You know, the minimum could be just a $5,000 contribution to start. But the nice thing is you can add to it over time. And this stands in, in stark contrast to what I would call the private foundation, which can take months to establish, requires significant time, financial investment, and, and significant legal fees to set it up. So once the money is set up, once the account is set up, once it's established, the donor advised fund charitable sponsor, they handle all the paperwork. So that includes managing the investments, record keeping, tax receipts, grant administration. That allows you to focus on your charitable goals. By contrast with a foundation, it requires a lot more work, time, energy, and effort. So do you control the donor advised fund? How much control does somebody actually have with one of these funds? So control is, is a key differentiator for a donor advised fund versus a lot of other giving vehicles. And we'll talk about another one shortly. When the donor, when you as a donor, when Alan makes his contribution to the DAF, he's making a gift of cash or assets irrevocably to a public charity. And once that public charity accepts the money, it's theirs. It's not yours anymore. It's theirs. And again, the term donor advised fund is reflective of the relationship. The donor only has advisory privileges to grant assets from the account. That's it. Private foundation, again, you control it all. And again, when you look at the donor advised fund, again, you can't make grants to individuals. It has to go to a nonprofit. You can't receive anything in return, so it can't include a dinner at an event. Uh, you can't pay tuition for for a kid, for a child. Um, you can't use it for for college costs. You know, and these rules are pretty similar to those that are in the private foundation world. What's also worthwhile mentioning is the the amount of the deduction is different. Right, the amount you can deduct to a public charity, you can give up to 100%. Whereas to a donor advised fund, it's somewhere between 30% or 60%, depending on the specific type of asset. But if you're looking to capture and bunch deductions for charity quickly, this is a great way to do it. You know, when we look at the donor advised fund, the nice thing is if you want to give also, if you want to give, let's say, anonymously you can give anonymously without anybody knowing where the money came from. So it has a lot of, you know, it checks a lot of boxes. There's no, there's no minimum cost to it. There's typically no mandatory 5% distribution like a donor advice fund. So here, here's an example of a situation where client was going to give away, call it $100,000, didn't have the cash. 
So he was going to sell a security, pay the tax, and then whatever was left, he was going to donate to charity. So assuming capital gains rates roughly 20%, you know, depending on the bracket, $100,000 fair market value, cost basis $5,000, there would have been a tax had he just sold the securities and donated the proceeds, he would have ended up with a tax of $11,000 roughly and a charitable contribution of 81,000. After our conversation together, and the way I would phrase this is, listen, if you're willing to plan a gift, Izzy, Robert, and Sam, the IRS is willing to forgive a tax. So by donating the stock and not selling it, Donate the hundred thousand to the donor advised fund. You now capture a hundred thousand dollar deduction, not an eighty thousand dollar deduction, and now you have saved thirty seven thousand dollars because of your tax bracket, and you didn't pay the tax on the sale. So I really, really think between now and the end of the year, this could be a very, very valuable tool for those that want to quickly get in their their charitable deductions. Um, before December 31st, and it's user to lose it. The second thing, and this has probably been the most popular this month, I, I, I have probably seen five of these across my desk, and that's what we call the charitable lead trust. The charitable lead annuity trust versus a uni trust um, is a very, very unique tool. You know, it's a charitable trust. It's a great way to, to leverage your generosity, the family's generosity, while at the same time producing a very, very significant income tax deduction and i'm going to walk you through the numbers in a moment essentially it's the reverse of the charitable remainder trust in other words you put cash in or securities into this irrevocable trust you're going to get this big tax deduction depending on the term that you've decided to pay the charity for and then at the end of the term whatever is left either will revert back to you or maybe it goes to your kids so in a nutshell, it's it's a trust. It makes an annual distribution or more frequent distribution based on a term of years or based on your life. And at the end, whatever's left comes back to the family. And this is a great vehicle. So who's it suitable for? It's suitable for, let's say if somebody has a spike in income, significantly high income, and I'll give you an example, and they wanna make a gift to a charity. And by the way, you can be, you could be your own trustee and you can use a donor advised fund with this. So you can control the money going from your charitable e trust to your donor advised fund. So this is kind of a very unique tool. So this is no story, as my father would say, story time. But last night I got a call from a client. I changed the name to protect the innocents. Uh, Tom and Jody, they're married, two kids. They live in New York City by Central Park. Yes, that's a lot of money. He made almost $30 million. And that was all predicated on his base bonus. He exercised some stock options because he was very, very concerned that next year's rates were gonna be significantly higher. And he also accelerated converting from a traditional IRA to a Roth. So his income this year was $30 million. That's what it says on the pay stub roughly, all the income added up. One of their kids is a special needs child and they've been philanthropic. They set up a donor advice fund last year and he's looking for more strategic strategic solutions. So I said, let's look at the CLAT. This may be an interesting idea. We did this all on the phone and I sent this to him about midnight last night. I said, so basically, here, here's a thought. I know you got a lot of liquidity because you exercise the options. So you're sitting on a lot of cash, you don't need it. So let's look at setting up a $10 million CLAT, okay? And it doesn't matter, you could say a million dollars. You could set up a CLAT with $300,000, but you wanna make it valuable enough that that it's beneficial to get over the cost so you know 10 million dollar clat he gave me an, a rate of return of about eight percent it's going to pay out five percent of the initial principal for 10 years so the deduction is based on the present value of the annuity stream that gives him a 47 percent tax deduction on 10 million dollars it's a 4.7 million dollar tax write-off and at the end of the 10 years, whatever remains inside of that charitable trust, depending again on the market performance, is gonna revert back to him and his wife. In this case, 14 million. Now we know that's a fallacy because depending on the performance, it could be up, it could be down. I don't know. So what's the downside with the CLAT? Well, irrevocable. 
number one. Number two, if you die during the term, it comes back into the estate to some extent. And number three, the downside is it's a grantor trust. So that means you have to pay the taxes on the annual income that it earns. So this could be, if you have somebody with significant assets, this may be a really terrific tool. Let me also share, and we're coming to the end, let me share with you something else, and that's called QCDs. These are very, very hot, qualified charitable distributions. And basically, like my mother, she doesn't really need the income, she doesn't need to take the money out of the IRA, except for the fact that the IRS mandates she takes her minimum required distribution because if she doesn't, there's a 50% penalty. Because she's over 70, she can satisfy her required minimum distribution by taking the money from the charity, from the IRA and sending it to the charity. She can't touch it. It's got to go directly from the IRA to the charity. So she never pays the income tax on that money. And for those that don't itemize, this is even a better way of making a charitable contribution. It's capped at $100,000 and you can't accept, you can't receive in return any sort of goods or services for this. So in conclusion, there are a lot of great techniques. I'm a big fan and a lover of making a donor advice fund available for those before the end of the year. Look at bunching the charitable contributions into one year if you don't get the benefit because you're taking the standard deduction. Consider utilizing charitable lead trusts as a terrific vehicle to make a contribution, big upfront tax deduction, maybe some gift tax, use up part of your gift tax. And then we have all these other tips, tricks, tools and resources to kind of help you out with um, the various types of um, charitable planning ideas. But that's where we are for this year. I think we have a lot of great stuff to do between now and the end of the year, if we could do it. So I'll open it up for any questions or or comments that anybody may have. Jonathan, the first question is, what? where would a private operating foundation fall in as a potential vehicle? Is that more like a public charity or more like a private foundation? Yeah, so it's a good question. And I think we need, why don't you and I spend a, a day on, let's do a seminar just on private foundations because private foundations offer a lot more, you, you and I both know that a, a foundation can offer a lot more flexibility than the donor advice fund, but it comes with it some costs, right? There are legal setups. You got to file an annual 990. There's public information. There are different limitations that apply, right? The 20 and 30% versus let's say the 30 and 60%. It, it's a great vehicle for those that can afford to have one. And especially maybe you have an art collection. We could do, we could create our own museum or something. So I think there's a lot of great opportunity to leverage the use of, um, foundations, all different types. Right, right. And I would say, you know, to the advisor, to the lawyers on the call specifically, I don't find the drafting of a private foundation or a private operating foundation to be difficult at all. It's much easier than a SLAT. It's easier than a revocable trust. So maybe our profession overcharges for these things because I don't have two to three thousand dollars worth of time to prepare one of these. It just it doesn't have to be so so expensive. I mean, I've done them for people for a $10,000 donation so that they could get recognized in the community. And then they got excited and they put more in. But I don't, I don't think it has to be, you know, mega dollars to um, do it. So another question is, with the $100,000 per year uh, ability to transfer from an IRA to charity, is it, is it really unlimited this year? Because you pull it out of the IRA and adjust your AGI up. And then, so you could take a hundred million dollars out of an IRA, give it all to charity. And if you're, as long as you're not 59 and a half. So is that, is that correct? It's a, it's a very doable technique. We, we had a call the other day, Alan, with a client that they already maxed out the hundred thousand, each of them, the husband and the wife. And they're very philanthropic. They, 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 kind of knocked it out of the ballpark with one specific investment. And like, what should we do? And I said, listen, ultimately, it's the worst asset for you to leave to your children because it's subject to estate tax based on your estate. 
levels, and it's also subject to the income tax. It's my recommendation. Number one, change the beneficiary designation. Let's leave it to charity. So that way, the estate, as you know, gets a write-off dollar for dollar. Number two, I said, why don't you start giving now? Give with a warm hand rather than a cold hand. Don't you want to see your money being used rather than you're gone? You don't know what they're doing with it. So he loved the idea, and that's what they ended up doing. They pulled out about $500,000 between the two and just gave the cash away, and they got a dollar for dollar right off. So great point, Alan. So another question is, when would you recommend a, a CLAT, a charitable lead annuity trust versus a charitable remainder trust? Oh, great question, great question. So, so I look at the vehicles as two independent types of vehicles. The vehicle for the, the charitable remainder trust, I look at it more for a client selling an asset, we're looking to structure an immediate sale not have to pay the tax right now, look to diversify the portfolio, and we want to generate for ourselves an income stream, an annuity, a pension, whatever you want to call it, for ourselves for a period of years, and then the rest will go to charity. The lead trust, again, same thing. You're looking at getting an upfront tax deduction, but I don't want to sell an asset. So I would use the lead trust. I'd probably dump a lot of cash into it, not so much securities, and I would use the remainder trust to kind of sell a portfolio that's highly concentrated. Mr. So-and-so just retired from Pepsi. He's got $20 million of stock, $5 million of stock, but he's no longer at the company. He's concerned like, the comp I'm not there. I don't have inside information. I'm concerned. How do I diversify out and protect my wealth? That's the answer for that vehicle. Because remember, with the charitable lead trust, you're the grantor. So even if you put the highly appreciated stock into the lead trust and you sell it, you get tagged with the tax. The whole point in the remainder trust is not to get tagged with the tax right now and to pay the tax like an installment sale over a period of time. So they're kind of two different animals. They're two different vehicles. And with the low interest rate right now being what it is, the lead trust is more of the opportunistic plan for those with cash. And I think the charitable remainder trust really works very well for somebody that's got a highly appreciated asset and looking to diversify. That's a great answer. It would really take, what, about eight hours to cover these charitable planning topics to a reasonable degree? You and I could knock it out in probably an hour and a half because people are so smart. All, all the people that listen to you are so smart. They're gonna, they, they get it. So it, 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 we could do it pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll definitely come back for part two when you're ready. And uh, we thank everybody for your questions, comments, and suggestions. Send the easy questions to Jonathan. I mean, send Jonathan the hard questions. Send me the easy questions. Um, Jonathan, one of the things I really love about you is your passion, both for people and for the financial world, and how you're able to help people unite, put those passions together. You know, so many people go to a lawyer or a CPA or a financial advisor and they get very sterile advice. It's like, hello, Mrs. Jones, you need a trust and you need a charitable. You care about Mrs. Jones and you care about her charities and you care about her children and you care about getting stuff right and you care about avoiding taxes. So hats off to you for that. I think it's a Gasman thing. I, I would echo the same comment about you, Alan. There's no doubt about it. We're passionate about our people. Yeah, yeah, we are. Okay, so let us know. A lot of you are professionals. I always enjoy tell you telling us what we missed or what we could add to our outlines. We'll bring Jonathan back as soon as he's ready. And I hope everybody has a fantastic rest of your Saturday. Thank you.